I am unashamed. What about you? So welcome back to Unashamed. If uh, if you're listening, it always sounds like we're just all right there together. But if you're watching, uh, you can see that I'm in the southern layer today. Hadn't been down here in a while checking on things. And Zach uh, is with us with a little bit different look and backdrop. Zach, you doing some uh, spring cleaning there? or Re- Remodeling. We remodeling. are remodeling. Remodeling. We're actually remodeling at the house. Um, my my place up here is becoming. Are you living uh, in your studio now? Well, I'll just say that I'm I'm not living here, but there is a a collection of junk that is <laughs> uh, rapidly accumulating. So, <laughs> well, I was just there uh, in the studio with you recently, yeah, and with a wedding that had just happened, and so everything had been rapidly put in that space and so it what looks so nice right where you are right around you is is not oh, is yeah. a, a little bit chaotic yeah i've got a lot going on in here it's a it's very disruptive so i apologize well i'm not in an advance. investigator but based on what i've seen when you first came on we weren't recording yet yeah. you had a big bunch of clothes that looked like they needed to be washed or they just got to wash your the camera shot is now sideways <laughs> It, I'm thinking they're well. You uh, the same bookshelf, but you're at a caddy. Oh corner. yeah, 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 you, yeah. I'm Good beginning man. to think there's been some disruptions at home. <laughs> it well, it seems one, like it's... he had one that uh, was married, and and uh, now they've come to dad to, with the clothes to help out with the wash. That's he's washing yeah. clothes and moving furniture. That's modern day America there, and saying yeah. he's doing some yeah. remodeling. Yeah, basically, well, I, I basically, walk- Jace, I'm hearing a cry for help. Is what? <laughs> oh, if you, I, I, I'm, if, admit it. I wish you guys would come up here and help and help wash clothes and yard work. I just, I just haven't had the uh, courage to ask you yet because I, I feel like I would be rejected with any kind of request like that. I think you need to just walk into the main room and say in a very loud voice, "Family meeting, <laughs> family meeting," and just start there. Yeah, that's good. That is good advice. Yeah, yeah. but he can't do that nowadays because he's the boy who cried wolf. He found out he had a fatty liver. He called them all together, and, and man, everybody was depressed for three days. They thought he was dying. It was just, you just need <laughs> to lose someone, a little weight. <laughs> I think someone has said in the past that a situation becomes a crisis when cattle or women stampede. <laughs> I think that's what he's faced with here. It might be. <laughs> It might I'm not be. sure what that means. But. <laughs> Think about yeah. it a little bit. It'll come to you. <laughs> There's no cattle around here. Right? But, at I least mean. at least, Dad now says somebody. He quit attributing it to uh, William Shakespeare. Yeah. So, so Jace, you, I know you got a guest there that's uh, observing today. Tell us about who that is. At Mia's last surgery, uh, you know, you kind of go from one building to the next. And uh, I met the director at her hospital where she was at and uh, he was really nice i mean i think he probably sees a lot of people come through there that are like which door do we go to where do we go to next and uh he brought us a couple cups of coffee and made us feel very comfortable during uh you know trying time so we kind of got to be friends he was passing through he was like let's go eat breakfast i said how about come and hang out at the podcast but uh (laughs) So, cause it's duck season. So we duck hunt, then we do the podcast. And uh, mm-hmm. so, yeah, we have a studio audience. So if you hear one voice of laughter in the background. <laughs> well, he's fun. probably already had quite the observation watching this chaos show we've put on so far today. So did y'all hunt today? Is that the, cause it, oh, the weather's we did. like perfect? So I've been sick. And so I didn't think we were going to get them yesterday. I didn't feel great. And my wife had just got back from visiting the grandkids. So I didn't go yesterday because the day before we shot one wood duck and two snipe, which the two snipe were world class because they lit on the only land within what hundreds of yards and i said is snipe season open i look yes and they're way better eating than a duck and so i systematically went over stalked and shot the two snipe 
So I felt pretty proud. But, you know, that doesn't want you to wake up the next morning at 4 and go duck hunting again. So I didn't yeah. go, and guess what happened? They got them. They hammered them, and it was <laughs> it was Phil, Larry, Curly, and Mo. And they <laughs> hammered them. <laughs> now, Phil, uh, if you want to disagree with me, disagree. I mean, there's no telling what happened because they were they were sending me texts. It's what woke me up yesterday morning. Can you can you define the three stooges? Can you tell me? I mean, I'm curious who has been. You want to give the three stooges? Well, Phil? they came yeah. together pretty quickly into a team to to get these ducks because we hadn't seen many ducks. So actually, they just kind of swarmed the whole thing, and uh, there was guys, you know, Jersey Joe was one of them. Jersey Joe oh, was okay. one. Uh, Jersey okay. Joe, Burley, son, Burley was the other. Let me identify them. And the other, <laughs> Phil said today, I was one of them boys that married one of one of you boys is, is uh, daughter. <laughs> <laughs> I was like. Well, Phil, he's uh, part of your family, son? too. But then he did say, so we won't embarrass him, he said, Christian. Well, yeah, we Christian. started out We started out with four sons and a long-lost daughter come along. So that made five. And it, and it was amazing as you look up, and it's like about that long. And There's you, people everywhere. You have 50 people. Yeah. So came, it was came, that came out of that those marriages. That one marriage, Miss <laughs> Kay and I, and now you, you're amazed at how many fifty to fifty five somewhere. Along yes, in there. it's closer to sixty. So it was yeah. Sadie's husband, but he's only hunted. Was that his third hunt ever? Third duck hunt. Yep. Yeah, he's and, brand uh, new. So you had Burley, who's kind of the he's kind of the camp guy. He lives in Colorado. He just comes over here and hangs out in bed to go. But he's got a he's got a he's got a house though. Then he built a house right next. He has to a house here, but it's not. It looks like your house. It's not finished. <laughs> only, only, only in Jesus would you run up on a guy who is a computer expert. That's I've, Jersey I've, Joe. I've never, I don't have a cell phone and all that stuff. So <laughs> he finds me intriguing because I said, I want a telephone. That's it. Not a cell phone where you can see a person's butt if they want to show you. I don't want to look at that. I want it clean, nice, and just get get your business. What do you want? Okay, I'll try to help out. And and But, but it just doesn't fit anymore. Now, Phil, you're you're right. I'm glad. I, I, that's the one thing I'm glad you're still graphic mm. on is what's happening on the internet. Because you're right, you you don't you don't even have to go pursue that, and it's out there. In yep. Five seconds. You're looking at. Yeah. So that was shame. an interesting blindfold. You're right. Uh, I mean, their their expertise skills, but they came together. That's the right. team came together and pulled it off, which is pretty impressive, Dad. Hey. You were just saying a week ago, we I'm not who I once was, but it sounds like to me you pulled it together and and took over and became the the uh, the alpha dog yet again. I was I was I was actually first I thought they were kidding. I thought they were pranking me. Yeah, because they were like, "Well, we're because I was getting different numbers." from all of them in the blind who had a cell phone. I was like, well, how many do you have? You know, it was like eight. And then Burley said eight. Jersey Joe said 12. And Christian was like, I think we have too many. <laughs> so I was like, you're sitting beside each other. <laughs> have a conference. But then Burley finally sent a picture, which what was fascinating about it, is he took the picture and there was a big pile of ducks, but I saw all my stuff in the picture. He had my flashlight, my gloves, <laughs> and my jacket. That's why I, I did like, so good. Go ahead and use my stuff while you're at it, which I couldn't find my light this morning. <laughs> I was like, yeah. what are these people doing? So they killed a lemon of ducks. Now, I, I asked them how many shells they shot, and they all just kind of busted out laughing, so... But tell about tell about Jersey Joe, and we'll move on. Shooting his first duck, 
A mallard drake was locked up, coming down, beautiful duck, and it was on the end of the blind. He was where, on my where, end where of you the blind. Usually, uh, yeah, stationed the, the sacred place down there. So using Jersey your stuff, took your place, and I said, shoot him. Jersey. When you said to shoot him, because Christian, who this was a funny story, Phil told me the details. So Christian is out in the decoy. Why was he out in the decoys? He was leaving. Oh, so he's ready to go. He had his limit, and he was walking away. Okay. And, and look up the duck. Here comes the duck. So here here comes another. Phil says, stay still. Did you even remember his name, or did you just say, hey? Sadie's man. Sadie's <laughs> man. I he don't said, know. Sadie's <laughs> man, stand <laughs> still. <laughs> so then you told Jersey, because he's on the other side of the blind, so it was safe for him to shoot. And you said, shoot him, and then you. And, and, and he's the only one that shot. So for the first time in his life. And then he missed the first shot, right? But Missed then, the first shot. He bounced back quickly, and he shot the duck. And I said, Jersey, you have your first unadulterated kill. You, you, you got your mallard duck there. And he was in the air, wasn't sitting on the water. I said, good job. So that was his first duck he had ever shot by himself that he knew he got. And what Instead was, of boom, 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 boom. Yeah. And what was his response? He, he he was speechless. He said, it's the greatest <laughs> thing that I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> Phil told me this morning, he said he finally got one that he knows he got. Because up he until this he time, he was playing the role of Cy. Shoot in yeah. the bunch and say, I got two. And then you hand yeah. him the two. Yeah. And uh, Phil said he he finally shot one on his own. He said he and he did he was speechless at first. He said then he never stopped talking about it the rest yeah. of the morning. <laughs> greatest morning he said I've ever spent. He's a computer buff, you know. So I got to give he him is. some counseling. I, I, I'm gonna, I have to tell him that he has to wait three days, not three minutes, before you say. Hey, remember that time a Mallard Drake come over on my side and I raised up and just <laughs> folded him? It, it's a three day waiting period, you not three have a minutes. Time in between. I now know yeah. why Acts chapter ten spells out the situation where God said it was a giant movie screen. He was giving the Apostle Peter a little instruction. He said, "Peter, four footed animals, birds of the air, you, you're." You kill them and eat them. Kill and eat. And Peter said, not I, Lord, not I. He said, do not touch, call something unclean that I've sanctioned. I've, I've made it clean. You can hunt and kill birds and animals and eat them. I was good that, that that's in the Bible. It's helpful. Yeah. It's a, how do you call it, Dad? Orders from headquarters. Orders from headquarters. So we're excited that uh, Hillsdale College is one of our sponsors of our podcast. And uh, Jace, you have any uh, college experiences uh, you'd yeah. like to share? I took two classes. I think they were uh, health and something and golf. Golf. And I, I, I did not pass either one. <laughs> and that was my college experience. <laughs> but I'll tell you this. If I could have done it online, Al, who knows? Exactly. Where I could be educationally today. You just needed to be 20 years in the future uh, in today's time. And Hillsdale College could have definitely helped you. Uh, good news is uh, they still can, Jace, because um, they offer courses, uh, history, economics, the great works of literature, the U.S. Constitution, all these things uh, that you can still take online. And they're offering some for free. They have uh, 40 free online courses. And uh, they've got great stuff that uh, is interesting to our audience because you got like the works of C.S. Lewis, uh, Genesis, U.S. Constitution, Rise and Fall of the Roman Republic. All these are fantastic. And so uh, we definitely recommend you uh, think about doing ancient Christianity. It's an 11 lecture course. Uh, a lot of inspiring stories about Christ and the apostles. So it's a lot to learn. Um, you get to set that pace and you'll love it. Go to hillsdale.edu slash unashamed to enroll. There's no cost, and it's easy to get started. That's hillsdale.edu slash unashamed to register. Hillsdale.edu slash unashamed. So, Jason, I got breaking news. Give us uh, our breaking news song. There we go. Breaking news. Uh, I'm I'm down here now. Actually, I have two, but the first one is I'm down here in Alabama. 
today, and it is a day of mourning for all of my neighbors because the great Nick Saban has retired from the University of Alabama. So everybody here is super sad, but I I got up feeling so happy today. Because Alabama now has to find you. might win every once in a while. That's exactly right. But I, don't, it don't matter who you root for in college football. This is unless you're an Alabama fan. This is this is good for all of us. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. So it's not. It's not. We're not Job's friends. We're not uh, celebrating demise. But um, we'll see what happens with Alabama. I'm sure they're going to land on their feet. But I will say this because a lot of LSU fans, uh, you know, have more of a hate than love relationship for Saban. But I'm saying he's the best ever. I'm telling you. Um, I mean, you know, seven national championships. He's, he six. was a great coach. And he turned our whole program around LSU. So uh, I have a lot of respect for the guy. So I, I hope he does well. I don't know anything about him personally. Uh, I know our, we have a lot of Alabama fans who are listeners. I know you guys are sad. And so we're not uh, we're not dancing on you today, but we are – it, uh, eagerly anticipating, but I did notice in my neighborhood there's a, there's a pall, there's a sadness uh, here because everybody loves saving. So, all right, I got one more breaking news, Jace. Hit the button. Well, you're full of it today. Huh? All right, I tell you, I'm right here. So we have more breaking news, Dad. Your new book. Uh, I could be wrong, but I doubt it. Why Jesus is your greatest hope on earth and in eternity is now available for pre-order. So we're super really? excited about that. Are yeah, y'all really it's, it's, naming the book that? I thought you were kidding. Oh, that's, I just no. threw it out there for the book people, and I said, <laughs> here's what it comes down to. I, I could be wrong. You can research it. So I gave yep. you that part. I doubt it. But you came up with the second. I saw that on the front of your shirt. I said, what you need to do is put on the back of it. I, I could be wrong, but I doubt it. I doubt <laughs> it is on the background as you're going away. So, <laughs> and that's a very strong doubt. Like, right? That that that's not what. There's no. I mean, it's 2024. It. We're all counting time by Jesus Christ. I would think if someone made that slot where the world counts time by him, you know, it's amazing to me that he is not at least investigated by everybody. Yeah, and that was really that was really the discussion, uh, obviously that led to the book. And so, while you know, a book is an interesting process because you're kind of working through it. And we give Dad, the evidence. We give yeah. the evidence of, of, of if we could be wrong, but I doubt it. <laughs> so, Dad, you started out just simply by asking question: Why? Why not Jesus? What, what's wrong with Jesus? Remember, that's how it started. We were sort of calling it the Jesus resume for a while. But then there are a lot of books called that, but nobody has one called, <laughs> I could be wrong, but I doubt it. Uh, although I did find one, Jason, that some guy wrote a book that said, I may be wrong, but I doubt it. <laughs> so, so a guy did have that one. So but we actually have a website, and guess what it's called? I could be wrong, but I doubt it, dot com. And so you can go there. Uh, you can actually get the first chapter of the book. Uh, if you go there and subscribe and order you a copy of the book. And we've said this before, uh, the book releases March the 12th, by the way. But when you pre-order a book, bookstores decide how many books they're going to put in their store based on how many pre-orders there are. So you, you really help us get more opportunity to sell books if you pre-order. So uh, this is for you, Unashamed Nation. This is the, I guess, sort of the crowning book of this four-book series that Dad has done. It started out with Theft of America Soul. Jesus politics uncanceled. And now I could be wrong, but I doubt it. And, and the whole thing is kind of just laid out the situation that Jesus ultimately is the answer. I, I think Jason, we studied Hebrews is kind of what solidified this book idea for dad and in, in his mind. Cause you know, when we, we started talking about why Jesus is the best and the answer for everything. I mean, it really is the ultimate, you know, solution for everything. And so I, I think that's the heart of what Dad, Dad talks about in the book. So check it out, pre-order. We'd love to get those uh, numbers up so we can get a lot going on. So that's my breaking news. Anybody else got breaking news? No, the last speech I gave at uh, Mighty Oaks, I, I did a little riff in Hebrews, and I had the my points were why Jesus is better. And I had like... Six or seven things that started with I, 
He's imperishable. He's immortal. He's indestructible. He's innocent. He invites everyone. It was a that was five off the top of my head. And but, all he wants is for us to love him and love each other. I mean, duh. <laughs> Reckon we need a little of that. <laughs> that should be your sequel. Yeah. Duh. Duh. And then have your. <laughs> Yeah, have the points after He'll that. Remove all your sin and raise you from the dead. I like. I'm that. like, uh, let's let's. Yeah, oh, I'm with you, Phil. I like it. Well, Jason, I want you to hang on to that uh, presentation you did because we're gonna we're gonna preach through Hebrews at some point this year at the, at our church. Ooh. So I want you to give that lesson at some point. That's just That'd my game, man. I know it. I know it's gonna be fantastic, but. You know, on Unashamed, we are still in the book of Luke, and we just we finally got through a long section uh, recently uh, in in chapters nineteen, twenty, and twenty one. Um, in the you last call podcast, it the temple. You need a you need a better name. The temple theology to uh, to the temple yeah. something. Because he was hanging out at the temple. He was telling stories. Yeah, he was teaching there. He was teaching. I called it holding court. The king holds court. But, yeah, it it could have been. I like something with the temple, the temple teachings or something. Because he was was laying out really what was about to happen. But he was also doing this back and forth battle because they're trying to figure out what to do with him. And we didn't mention this at the time, but, you know, one of the things by the timing of what's going on historically, because they're getting ready for the Passover. But, you know, every year, even now, the Passover is when Jerusalem is overflowing with people. And so that's been true for as long as there's been Judaism. So there are a lot of people around. And that's part of the issue by his enemies is because they're afraid of these large crowds because the worst thing that could happen in their minds is that a riot breaks out and then they got to deal with it. So they're trying to now figure out Jesus's demise without it turning into a riot. So that's kind of the backdrop in the setting when you get to the, at the end of chapter 21. And so interestingly enough, our last section that we did was Jesus laying out the ultimate demise of Jerusalem itself along with the temple. And we spent quite a bit of time talking about that. And this really is, I think what turned the corner Jay's probably to the enemies is because when he came out this strong against the temple, which is the core of everything that they did, that was like the final straw. Then it was like, mm. okay, he's, he's got to go. I mean, we got to figure out how to get rid of this guy. Yeah. That was always a way to get yourself killed. You know, I mean, he, he wasn't the first, well, he was the first one, but he wasn't the last one. And I was even, when Bill was talking about acts, 10 kind of tongue in cheek about killing ducks. I mean, you think about what, what that's actually talking about is exactly what Jesus was talking about with this building, this temple where Jews, Gentiles for all nations would come in. So when you, you know, when the sheet comes down and you have the, you know, the, all the different animals, I mean, it's not really about the animals. I mean, it's really, what it's really about is the inclusion of the Gentiles, which happens directly after that. There's more evidence that, Hey, no, the Gentiles, are being called up into this kingdom. And yeah. so don't call anything unclean that I've called clean. You know, I've called, I've called these people clean. I'm, I'm drawing all men to myself. And so that's the picture. So you can, you can see why um, if you grew up in a system that, that denied the Gentiles were, were dogs. And then someone comes along and they said, no, no, they're actually brothers. They're, they're coming in. That's very provocative. And that's a very provocative thing that Jesus is doing. Well, weren't these people, you know, I had a thought last night when I was studying this because it kind of hit me that this was the time of the Passover that he chose. I mean, of all the things he could have chosen, he chose that. Even when we get to his, you know, the Last Supper, because they're having the Passover meal, and it kind of hits you of like, well, where's the lamb? You know, because he had the unleavened bread and the wine, well, where's the lamb? Well, he 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 would be the lamb of God. Yeah. That would be, because this is right before he's arrested. And uh, it kind of hit me that, you know, all those passages we read where he drove out the 
the robbers and the temples and it, he he scattered all the animals he disrupted that it, well, it kind of hit me that didn't these all these people take these these lambs to the temple to have them sacrificed and now if you have no temple you have no sacrifices mm. so it goes along with him being the lamb yeah to be sacrificed once and for all for the sins. I mean, it was just kind of a moment that I thought, I think that's why he chose the Passover, which we'll get in that in depth when we get to the Last Supper. We're super excited about a brand new sponsor. It's called Five Star Football Package. And uh, Dad, when I saw these guys were signing on, I couldn't help but think about a story that you tell uh, about you guys playing football in the yard. Tell us that quick story. Our football was a, a, a sock. <laughs> stuffed tightly with other socks. You couldn't get a spiral on it very well. But it was what we called a football because that's all we had, poor snakes. But uh, we looked up one day and a fancy little car comes up. The guy unrolls a windshield down, throws a regulation football out on the ground. It bounced about twice. And we looked at it, and we looked up, and the guy took off. Just went, He didn't say a word. He just <laughs> threw it out the window. And we, we watched him till he left, and we all gathered around that ball. I said, it's now begun. Un- <laughs> Amazingly, I played quarterback the rest of my high, junior high, high school, and, and uh, college. And, uh, well, so somebody obviously knew you had some skills, and that's what these guys do. Um, you know, they what they do is they find a way to help create elite football players. This package for a five five star football package is designed to help unlock your son's full football potential. Uh, it consists of online training programs that are tailored for high school and youth football players. They have seven programs. Teaches all the latest research, uh, position specific techniques uh, to help your son become a great football player. Uh, it's got gym workout plans, field workout plans, specific drills, speed, a change of direction. So it's a lot of great stuff. Uh, and it's also founded on Christian values, which we love that as well. So if you're ready to invest in your son's football career and potentially save hundreds of thousands with scholarship money, Head over to five star football package.com. That's five is in the number five star football package.com. Join thousands of other young players pursuing their dreams today and use the code Phil for 20% off all positional packages. When I was doing research as well, I was reading about Josephus in some of his writings was talk because there was, was so many people were coming to the temple. And so they were talking about trying to do a census. And so Nero, this is years later when Nero was the emperor. This is after Jesus' death. But the uh, governor of, of Palestine area there, he ha- ordered a census to see how many lambs were slaughtered on one particular year in Jerusalem. And Josephus records that 256,500 lambs were slaughtered that one year. And and they counted them. And there are, it's all done in the temple. And the minimum people that would celebrate a Passover meal were at least 10. That was in the law. So they factored in, therefore, there was over two and a half million people. Now, these are people coming. They're not just living there in Jerusalem. They're coming from all over. But Think about that 250,000 plus lambs being slaughtered. And this is after Jesus had died when they did the census. And it was all for naught because the lamb had already, the, the one Passover lamb had already given his life. And that shows you, though, this idea of the need for the temple to end and the way the process had been going was so strong why Jesus predicted it, which it would happen not long after the census was taken. Because we didn't need that anymore, yeah. you know the lamb had been the lamb had been given on that night. That was the last Passover supper, and it's just I found that fascinating. One that there were so many people there, and two of all the death that really didn't have to happen if you just put your trust in Jesus. Yeah, really. well, it's difficult to read when you go back and see the history of the Passover and Exodus and the ten plagues and 
you know, the last one is this, your firstborn would be killed as a representative of your the sins of your family, which seems for us, you know, now in America, you're like, wait, what? They were, I mean, it just seems like some weird movie that went awry. But in their culture, you know, if they're going to have a God, it, it, it was something that they thought, okay, you know, there has to be a sacrifice for sin. So instead of having your firstborn, if you sacrifice a lamb and put the blood on the doorpost, that wouldn't take away your sin, but it would be payment for the sins of your family, which is, goes back to the history of this, which I'm sure we'll have to get in depth in that when we get to the Passover meal. But that's yeah. really was the shadow, his relationship with Israel and that custom, having a temple where God and humans meet and having sacrifices as payment for sins, you know, of lambs, which it could be worse because what if it was your firstborn? I mean, you know, the yeah. those who trusted him, they, they started putting the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. So no, that's, that's good. It makes people feel uncomfortable. It's another reason where if you start reading the Bible at the beginning, it's really hard to keep going because you don't understand their culture, and that seems crazy. So yeah. it's like I always tell people, they're like, well, how I'm, – I'm having a conversation with a guy who's driving over here Sunday to be baptized, but I'm like, start in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and go from there. Because he's like he had always tried to start at the beginning. He never made it to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> so guess what happened? You missed Jesus, <laughs> and you you missed it. Now you make a great point because if you start with the good news of Jesus and then go back and see what it took for that to happen, it it definitely helps you understand it so much better. I mean, because all those things were pointing to Him. Remember, He said that all things are fulfilled in Me, all law, all prophecy, everything. And so it, in the modern day, when we have the word of God, it's definitely best to do it that way. Go back then, see where it comes forward. And then you see what the apostle said afterwards as well. Well, Jason, yeah. I think it, even this little section that we're going to start in today in uh, 22, 1 through 6 in Luke is, is even, I think Luke is setting it up even to talk about that Passover because, and I hadn't really thought about that until this particular time, because if you think about it, the plans of God have always been attempted to be thwarted by the evil one. And that's what we're going to see with this bringing up Judas, I think, at this point that Luke brings him up. And I thought about it, even you go back to the Egypt and when the Passover happened and the people of God were going to be let out of Egypt, you know, the evil one then was prompting Pharaoh and here was Moses trying to convince him with all these miracles and that, you know, look, you got to, you know, you got to listen to God. You got to do what God says. But he continued to just this back and forth. And so I, when I thought about it in this context, I thought, man, Luke does a great job of bringing up Judas here because here was a guy who Satan manipulated and he followed him. And then the enemies of Christ were being led by Satan to try to kill him. Of course, what Satan didn't know is he came there to give his life. You know, he, he doesn't understand what's going on. And neither neither did his apostles understand it. That's right. Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we're going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. Yeah. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. He was. They will mock him. They did. Insult him. They did. Spit on him. They did. Flog him and kill him. And they did that. On the third day, though, he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. They've been with him three years, Al. Its yeah. meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. That would be tough. Where was that, Luke 18? That's Luke 18 leading into what we, where we are yeah, now. Are. Exactly. But, uh, well, pretty, I think pretty amazing, Al. Yeah, yeah. I think it it also, you know, when you read books about Judas and and you look up, you know, things about him, it is one of the profound mysteries 
of the Bible. And most of the questions are asked, well, why did Jesus choose him if he knew that he was going to betray him? And I think what's missing in all that debate, because I know all those questions are going to come to people's minds as we go through Judas, which it is a valid question. I think what comes to mind here is that evil in our world is way more mysterious and way more difficult to wrap your head around on how it works. It's it's always like lurking. It's deceiving. It, you read all the passages about this, and I think you really see a picture of that here. Because how could you be this close to the Son of God the whole time Yeah, and be a million miles away in your heart? So I think as we go through this, you'll have to keep that in mind. When you try to just make blanket statement questions, because when you think of this, God created everything good. It was good and very good. And then all of a sudden, people chose evil. But think and, about it. And a it lot started of it. a snowball effect. And you have all these powers, and you read all these the powers and principalities and dark power. You, you know, in Ephesians mm-hmm. 6, it kind of goes through a list there. And there's no doubt there's evil in the world. Yeah, And it was so close to Jesus here that that makes it scary. Because you see a guy, you know, in church, and then all of a sudden he does something that's just, you can't wrap your head around. You're like, the whole time he was sitting in this church, well, it could be worse. This is one of Jesus' chosen 12 to start. twenty two one. Of Luke. Now the feast of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching, which is why we kind of started there because and we'll get into that in more detail in the next section. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus. You know, he's he's become a threat to them. For they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. And so then if you skip ahead, when he does the Last Supper, the Passover meal, and which is what I referred to, where he had the unleavened bread and the wine. There's no lamb, because I believe he was he was making a subtle point that he is the lamb. He then makes this announcement about being betrayed in that s- supper. Uh, that's in verse uh, um, 20, isn't it? Let me get my glasses. Yeah, verse 21 is when... All right, so in verse 20, it says, In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This is this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you, representing the Lamb, by the way. Yep. By the hand of him who is going to portray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. And then this is really fascinating. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. Which is, I found fascinating, Jace, because they didn't immediately think of Judas. They all were looking at each other like anybody was capable, which I, I find that fascinating as well. So then we'll read the rest of it in other accounts. But in 47, it says, while he was still speaking, a crowd came up. And the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. And Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. And we know from, is that Matthew's account, that it was yeah, Peter? This, yeah, But Jesus answered, no more of this, and he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priest, 
the officers of the temple guard and the elders who had come for him, am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour, and here's another reference to this evil that I was referring to. Yeah. When darkness reigns. Yeah. And you know what's interesting is, Jace, if you if you look at it, and I, and I like the way you painted the picture about how Satan is working here, because these people have decided that this is a threat to them, to their power, to all of it. So they want to get rid of him, but they can't do it publicly because there's too many people that are following him and following him and love him. And so they've come up with this thing. We somehow got to do it when there's no people around. And the only way they could really get that done was somehow through the inside. Then Judas approaches them and says, I'll help you out because I I know where they'll be when there's not people around. Right. So you see this plan as it sort of unfolds. But it hit me this particular study that not only that, but they had their mind made up that Jesus was a fraud. I mean, they didn't believe he was who he said he was. And so by one of the 12 coming to them and saying, I'll help you take him down, I think Satan used this whole scenario to just make them feel stronger about the fact that he really wasn't who he said he was. In other words, why would one of his own followers be willing to turn him over to us if he was really the son of God? And so I'd never thought about that before until this particular time I looked at it, but I thought Satan used what they already had in their minds to then convince them even more by Judas approaching them with this plan to be able to take care of Jesus. So, you know, once you make your mind up that you're going to follow the evil one and follow a plan that's not of God, then everything that happens will then fit into your narrative to, to prove in your own mind that you're doing the right thing. Cause I mean, they were convinced they were doing the right thing. Yeah. I think it's good. Uh, The term I've heard used is called confirmation bias where you, you basically seek out information or, or people who will validate what you want to be true. Yeah. And so when he came to them, I mean, I'm sure they welcomed it without any skepticism whatsoever. I mean, right. they want, they wanted it to be, they, 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 I mean, they wanted Jesus to be a fraud because it, because if he, if he wasn't, then it's going to completely change their entire structure, uh, th- their whole power system. Everything's like, everything's going to change. So they, I'm sure they welcome Judas in with open arms, and yeah, Satan uses that, and he does. I think he does. He does with us too, right? I mean, he he uses us in our own jealousies and weaknesses, and we, you know, we we have jealousy or whatever towards someone, and then we want to believe the worst about them. You know, sin is more complicated. You know, when you're worshiping anything other than God which is really the root of where sin comes from. Yeah. Then you start having selfish desires and, and then all you need is opportunity. Um, you know, when I did that prison ministry for a couple of years, I was amazed that if I let the group talk, they would all champion the fact that they had been, you know, two years since they had been with a woman and they're, you know, sacrificing. And I'm like, well, there's no women out here. You know, the the one thing that you don't have the opportunity to do, you're saying, well, look at what I'm having to give up. And what's amazing is most of the guys who would get out during the time I was out there, well, I never saw them again. You know, they would we'd have a meeting place because they would be like, I'm going to get my life right. I'm giving my life to the Lord. As soon as I get out, I'll meet you at the church parking lot. And most never showed it was amazing once they got back out where the opportunities were the desires of their heart was then here we go again but i thought about that when i think that's how you know sin happens to us so you read the passage in james 1 that says god doesn't tempt anyone uh what what is it? Let me read that. Each one is tempted by his own evil yeah, desire. His own evil desire he is dragged away yeah. and enticed. Uh yeah, verse thirteen, James one thirteen. When tempted when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, 
nor does he tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. And you see this process then. Then after desire is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin when it is full grown gives birth to death. Yep. And so really this was a kiss of death, not for Jesus, because his death actually champion the destruction of sin itself as far as the payment that we're concerned and death itself because he rose three days later but it was judas's kiss of death because when you read matthew's account this is uh matthew 27 early in the morning people came to the decision to put jesus to death they bound him handed they led him away and handed him over to pilate the governor when judas who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned. He was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the tree, chief priest and the elders. So you say, what? See, he's repenting. But it's, it's not repentance because he says, I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood, and which sounds like repentance, but watch what happens. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, it is against the law to put this into the treasury since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. And then when you read... Acts, the Luke's account in Acts, he brings the same principle up, which is very graphic. Yeah, it's Acts one eighteen. He says he brought a field, and he said when he he fell headlong, meaning when he hanged himself, his body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language Akodama, that means field of blood. Well, and and really. You know, it, it. I had a thought last night when I was studying that because it's so graphic, it's scary, and it makes you realize how deceitful our own desires are and how the evil, dark powers work against us. And all of a sudden, an opportunity comes up, and then you show what seems like remorse, and, and you say you've sinned, and you still respond selfishly to this. Because when you think about all those passages about Jesus saying, you know, bring your cross. You want to follow me, bring your cross. And even what we do as far as surrendering to Christ is a form, and even baptism, you know, it's, if Romans 6 goes through that. We die to sin. I mean, you're surrendering. But when you do it selfishly, you have what happens here, which is so yeah. ironic. And it made me think about what happened in the garden, because you think about what how how sin really happened. You had the evil one just subtly giving you ideas about did God really say and and coming up with a narrative that was contrary to God. And then really you think what led to the sin? Their focus on having the knowledge of good and evil, kind of the morality aspect, led to a bad decision. It led to peer pressure. (laughs) Then it led to blame shifting. And you saw how that's basically how men were separated from God. And here you kind of see the same thing. He's acknowledging morality, but it's almost like, just like in the garden, they they didn't realize the relationship with God, the trust, trusting God not to do something was at risk. That was the number one thing. And they were focused on, well, why can't I partake of this tree instead of I'm going to trust you. And so you see the same thing lived out with Judas here. Yeah. And I think it becomes such a question about hearts because I mean, really, if you think about it, this instance of when he kisses him and then, you know, basically says, you know, leads him to him when there's nobody around Peter responds with, as you read, with this, you know, like violent reaction because Peter's ready to die in that moment, you know, for what they're going to be doing. But when Jesus heals the guy's ear, 
he's crushed too. And it leads to later that night, him betraying Jesus as well by saying he doesn't even know who he is. So it's really interesting. You sort of see this cascade effect that's happening now because they had this narrative of what it was supposed to be like. And I think, which we're almost out of time in the overtime, I want to talk about Judas's character leading up to this moment versus Peter's because Peter up until this point, I mean, he's like any man, he's volatile, but he, in his character, he's wanting to do the right thing by Jesus. Judas did not in his heart and character, something was flawed and something was wrong. And so I think that's why you see the two choices. They both understood they did wrong, but one goes out and hangs himself in a field. And the other one, of course, becomes the guy who unlocks the keys to the kingdom of heaven and preaches the first gospel sermon. So it's such a it's such a picture. That's a big difference too. I mean, you and, and you look at to Jace's point too. Look at Judas. The the here's the thing about sin and that kind of sin. Now he he never repented, but he didn't even he wasn't even able to enjoy the promise that he thought he would get from the sin. So yeah. uh, you know, he I mean, he threw the money back, and it's kind of the same thing that happened with Adam and Eve. I love that parallel that you brought out, Jace. Um, you go back and read. Genesis account of the fall before the fall says that the, the Adam and Eve were naked. It didn't say they knew they were naked. It says they were naked and they were unashamed just as they were naked and they were unashamed. Then when they get into the, the temptation with Satan, the promise is if you eat this, you'll, you'll have the knowledge of good and evil. And as soon as they ate it, this is what the scripture says. The eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked. And so they did get knowledge. I mean, so Satan was partially telling the truth. It yep. wasn't a fu- the full truth. But the the reward that they thought they were going to get from not believing in God was actually, it was actually hell. It was actually, it wasn't, it wasn't a pleasure or he- it, it, it was, it, it was never what it was promised to be. And that is always the nature with sin, that it never, ever delivers on its promise. Ever and the nature of putting your faith in, in God is is that f- faith God never tells a lie, and so it, it always delivers on its promise to, for, for human flourishing, fulfillment, and and peace of mind. Yeah, if you could do it, and we're out of time, but if you could do a tagline, Zach, for Satan, it would be he always over promises and always under delivers, because that happens in anybody's life, and we've experienced that. So we're out of time. Uh, we'll talk more about this in our overtime segment. If you want to follow us over and hear more about Judas and his lack of character, you can do that on blazetv.com slash unashamed. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.